So what I'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit about, um, uh, I think a lot of people have heard about a top percent, but also talk about really the the path forward and really trying to talk about personalized genetic medicine and how do we provide therapies for all the patients who might benefit from exon skipping. And since we are a publicly traded company, I will be making some forward-looking statements and please refer to our SEC documents. I wanted to introduce you to the team, and, and um, the presence of Sarepta here at the, at the meeting is kind of light. And the reason it's light is everybody is back in Cambridge, Massachusetts, trying to compile all the documents that is necessary uh, to submit uh, for the NDA. Um, and and there's, there's four characteristics that I've been looking for in people uh, that want to work um, in, in, at Sarepta and, and really work in muscular dystrophy. And, and really, the expectation is they're smart people. They work really hard. Uh, very importantly, they have to understand the mission. And the mission is really all about patients. Um, and then the last one is they have to be collaborative. And if they don't have those four characteristics, I'm really not interested in hiring these people because that is the way to success. And I think I'll talk about collaboration, and it really is collaboration. It's collaboration within the patient community. If, uh, and the power um, really in the, in the area of Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the patient voice. That, that is what people want to listen to, not pharmaceutical companies or biotech companies, uh, but working together as a group and also for the companies being able to work together as a group. Uh, that gives us the strength and the ability to make some progress. So just a, a review, uh, we're focused on our uh, PMO chemistry, a phosphorodiaminate morpholino um, chemistry, and it's uh, anti-sense, and it's really involved in exon skipping. Um, and, and this chemistry has been very useful for us because it gives us a lot of versatility to be able to change the sequences and go after uh, different deletions. Um, it has a lot of specificity um, and also stability. And so that's why we've been uh, working with this chemistry for the last number of years. Um, and really, I think what we've been trying to say in, in regards to our overall development uh, in Duchenne is really the focus for, certainly for our company, is how do we improve the lives of patients with the Duchenne muscular dystrophy? And, and one of the questions, in fact, um, I often ask my team um, at the end of the day, and they're walking out, and I'll say, how have you made uh, the lives of boys with uh, uh, DMD better? Have you done something to make it better? And if someone is uh, close to missing a deadline, uh, and they say, you know, we're at risk for this deadline. And I said, well, then you can go back and explain to the family why we missed this deadline. And the response is, we won't miss that deadline. <laughs> and, but it is because it's about the, the, the focus of patients. And when you have that focus, it does make you work harder. And I think really, you know, what we're, I, I, you know, we're very interested in really making sure that we identify a pathway for all the boys who have exon deletions that could be amenable to exon skipping. Uh, it's the no child left behind attitude. Um, we're also trying to really identify some of the efficient regulatory paths for approval. And in many areas, especially when we talk about the follow-on exons, there is no regulatory path. We are going to have to work with the regulatory authorities to find the fastest path because the regular clinical development program is too long. Um, we also have to really, and we've been trying to learn, is incorporate the, patient spec the, the perspective of the patient in our clinical trials. And we're learning from the patients, and we need, need to do a better job. We're also trying to explore new endpoints, understand it so we can increase the speed of development, um, and really trying to find clinical designs that give us the answer but don't provide too much burden to the patients. And if we talk about you know, our development, you know, we are in a rare disease, and, and this is not an easy space, um, I think, as every company is, who's in there is finding out, because we have a small population to begin with. Um, we have, really, um, a lot of different mutations within the disease that may respond to different drugs. It's a heterogeneous patient population. They don't all progress at the same rate. Um, and only a small subpopulation, you know, especially in the personalized genetic medicine space, are going to be amenable to your therapy. And then they have to be able to perform the outcome measures, and then logistically they have to be able to participate, and they have to be in a geographic area that's close enough to a site. So all of these impediments are what we have to overcome. Um, and then I think what we're, again, trying to focus on is 
even in the preclinical, can we find biomarker developments and can we bridge from the pharmacokinetics and toxicology? Um, again, innovative clinical trial design, uh, looking at things such as a master protocol, uh, studying more than one drug at a time, uh, using patient-reported outcome measures um, in the studies, uh, and you know, talking to the investigators, uh, such as Craig McDonald, uh, who has been helping us with some of the instruments on this, understanding the natural history, and really the, um, many of the people in this audience, and certainly in Europe, have been you know, really instrumental in making sure that we understand uh, the processes. And then finally, taking um, really use of some of the regulatory approval pathways for things like accelerated approval and fast track. Um, again, at the center of all of the drug development, it does come to the patient. And one of the things I think we're um, trying to understand, and we're learning from the patients. You know, what is really the proper inclusion and exclusion criteria? Um, how do we incorporate the patient's voice in the clinical trial design? How is it easier? What is practical? And so all of the things that we do uh, is really, can we incorporate this, and do we understand the risk-benefit? And most importantly, do we understand the, the risk that the patients are willing to take, and can we give them a therapy um, that is practical and, and will add value to, the, to these boys and make them, make them stronger? Um, and so this is where we're at for our Exxon Skipping program. Um, and again, our focus is really to develop a family of PMOs that will target each mutation amenable to Exxon Skipping. Either it's going to be used alone, uh, and, but we're also very interested in working with other companies and other compounds. Can, can we have a better therapy? Uh, and probably a better therapy is going to be combination therapy. Just like if you look back at um, uh, cancer therapies, and, and certainly in, in my career, um, you know, we were, when we had um, leukemia for uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, um, it, when I was in early training, it was probably about a 50% fatality. Now it's a 95% survival rate. And that was combination therapy. And we got smarter and better, and we, and we did it faster. And that's what we need to do in, in Duchenne. We have to be able to work together to come up with therapies that make sense for patients. And this is really the foundation that we're talking about. So we have... We're trying to really develop a foundation for a Teplerson, and, and obviously um, uh, we're well on our way with this. But it includes a very important preclinical package, understanding the safety, uh, the pharmacokinetics, uh, and then we're doing the same for Exxon 53 and 45, again, so that we really understand um, the, the backbone chemistry. But when we get into the follow-on exons, um, we have to do something different. We have to be able to do uh, a smaller, faster package for preclinical toxicology. We have to do combined studies. We have to be able to make sure that it's not a 10 or 15 year development plan for every single drug, because that's unacceptable to us, and more importantly, it's unacceptable to the community. So that's, I think, the learning process that we all have to understand and how to do this better. Um, and as you know, once we get past the first three drugs, um, the, the incidents really fall down. We talk about, you know, the deletions. Um, when we get out here, it's impossible to do a normal clinical development path because there's in, insufficient numbers of patients. So again, that's what the focus that we're looking at very carefully is, how do we do this better? How do we do it faster? Um, and again, the purpose really is, we're trying to improve the outcome, and not just uh, what happens on the six-minute walk test, but how do you, you know, keep boys uh, walking for longer? How do you, you know, maintain their ability to rise from supine, climb four steps, uh, use their upper extremity? So that's really the focus, is really to have outcome measures that mean something uh, to patients. And this is where we're at with a lot of our programs, and um, you know, obviously, we uh, have talked about our uh, study that's ongoing. It's now over three and a half years of efficacy, uh, but we have a study that's well on its way, and we're comparing it to um, a, a cohort that's non-exon 51 amenable. 
getting the natural history, uh, and this is one of our potential confirmatory studies that we're looking at. Uh, we also um, have fully enrolled for our older boy po population, um, boys who are either poorly ambulant or non-ambulant up to 21 years of age. Uh, we've just started the younger boy study, and one of the things we've been able to do, we've, we've listened to the um, uh, researchers, and they have uh, suggested, again, we need to learn more about MRI. So we, we're working with the Imaging DMD group, and we're getting MRIs in all these boys to really understand how can that be used as a biomarker. Um, we've studied, we're well on our way in our Exxon 53 in Europe, our first study. We're doing a combination study of Exxon 45 and 53 that's both in the U.S. and Europe. And to really speed up development, um, because there was, uh, you know, we, we really wanted to very quickly understand um, the uh, toxicity and the, the uh, tolerance of this. So we're doing a, a very quick study in the U.S. And again, that's to accelerate the pathway in Europe. So this is our, where we're, our, our, our possible timelines, and it's obviously something that we hope to achieve. Um, but we're working for a mid-year submission for the NDA, and, and the team is working very hard for that. Uh, the FDA typically takes 60 days after that, and if it's an adequate um, um, amount of data, uh, then they will, um, they will file. And then the expectation there could be an advisory committee, which we expect. Uh, and could be as early at the beginning of next year uh, if it's successful. We're also doing the same in Europe. We've had uh, very good scientific advice. Uh, we've submitted our pediatric investigational plan that has to be approved prior uh, to submission. We're going to have another um, meeting with the um, MAA in the fall uh, and then planning then to file uh, very early in next year in Europe. So again, I'm trying to make sure the drug is available worldwide. And you know, one of the things that, you know, certainly I, I have learned over the years is that when you're doing drug development, the critical thing are, are the patients. And I think, um, you know, and I think the, the, the village uh, mentality of working together is so really very, very important. And one of the, um, the, the quotes that uh, impressed me, Paul Elstrom, who was a four-time gold medal Olympic sailor, he once said that, uh, if in the process of winning a, a race you lose the respect of your competitors, you haven't won anything. And I think that's true for industry, and I think it's also true for the patient groups. And I think we don't have enough time <clears throat> to have competition or bickering between the patient groups or between companies. We really need to be able to work together. And I think it's so important for the patient groups to work together to have a single voice to help every company that's here and I, to, to really help them at the advisory committee level, um, to support them because they're working very hard to try to help you. And, and I think that certainly is very important. And I think it's also very important for the companies to be able to work together. I really hope that um, Ketabase is, is successful, Idera, Summit, um, you know, Biomarin and, and Pfizer and Lilly. And we all hope that they're successful. Why? Because it helps the community. And we we learn from each other as companies, and we get better, smarter, stronger when there's competition. And so success of another company is success for us. And, um, you know, obviously, we, we need to respect those companies. We need to be able to work together. And I think that's something that the whole community can do very well. Um, <laughs> And I will say one of our collaborators in this process is the, F is the FDA. Um, and I can attest that this guidance uh, the FDA has taken to heart. And, and this is what they've been telling us for the last uh, two years uh, and to follow this. And, and Ron Farkas at one of our meetings did say, I am here to help you. And I, and I take him at his word. And I think the reason is, is that our package is stronger now after discussions with the FDA than it had been originally. So I think, again, we do have to work as a team. And I, you know, and, and I would look at the FDA and, and companies, you know, we're on different sides of the table, but the, really the purpose of, of both of us is to get drugs approved for boys with DMD, and that is what it's all about. So thank you, and um, I guess we're doing questions at the end. <laughs>